everybody. Thank you. Uh, we're being recorded. Uh, welcome to tonight's virtual town hall on wildfire preparedness. My name is Wei Tai Kwok, and on behalf of the Lafayette City Council, I want to thank you for your time and joining us this evening to talk about how we get prepared for wildfire in our community. Wildfire danger, as we know, has been rising over the last few years. And I actually did a little research since we last had our last town hall to find out that in 90 years of record keeping here in California, six of the seven largest wildfires in California have all occurred within the last 24 months since August 2020. So uh, those are the type of records we don't want to be breaking. But we know that the mega drought we're in uh, is about the worst in 1,200 years, and that this is lengthening the fire season and lengthening our risks. Uh, I myself was so worried when it barely rained in January and February of this year. So I, I think we're, we're in unprecedented times, and we do need to get prepared in order to uh, reduce our risks. And so that's why we're here tonight. Uh, we have city and local agencies uh, going to give a little bit of a presentation tonight and talk about what we are doing to prepare, our fire, our police, the American Red Cross, what are we doing to prepare? Uh, but we also need the public's help. We need your help, everybody here at, as in an all of the community's effort to keep ourselves safe. And I personally wanna recruit you later in this call to uh, put together your neighbors into a firewise community and uh, take further action on the ground to, to uh, help protect ourselves. So uh, the format today will be that we'll have uh, there, uh, several speakers. Uh, we'd like to invite you to type your questions into the chat and we'll answer the questions after all the speakers have gone. Uh, we'll also give you opportunities after we've uh, each of the speakers has spoken to raise your hand and you can ask questions live at the end as well. Uh, we're gonna try to keep this to 60 minutes. And as a reminder, uh, this session is being recorded and will appear on the city's YouTube website uh, after we're done. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to our very first speaker, who is Deputy Chief Aaron McAllister with uh, Contra Costa Fire Protection District. He's been with 30 years as a fire in the fire service and the last six years serving as the Deputy Fire Chief. So uh, Chief McAllister, if you'd kick us off, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Council Member, and uh, thank you for the participation in this event tonight. Uh, it, we have reached kind of critical mass where at that time of year, uh, where we are in the highest uh, danger zone uh, in terms of fire season. So uh, typically we look at September and October, really between now and when it rains, uh, all the fuels have dried out and cured and it's as dry as it's going to be uh, for the next two months until it rains. And this is the time of year where we see the most devastating fires. So I don't want the public to let their guard down just because there's no smoke in the air today and we're not reading daily reports of utter devastation around the state of California. We are still very much in the danger zone and we anticipate, we expect to see a significant major incidents around the state of California and beyond, frankly, um, in the next two months where there are very serious and significant wildland fires that uh, that risk life and property in the coming months. So uh, very much in the danger zone, even there, there's no smoke in the air. Um, for the community of Lafayette, we are your fire department. Confire is your fire department. Uh, we operate three fire stations in Lafayette, fire station 15, 16, and 17. Fire station 16 is one of the newest, most modern stations in the district, uh, recently reconstructed, meets all the modern earthquake standards, emergency generator, and everything that goes along with a modern fire station in the neighborhood. Uh, in terms of preparedness, CONFIRE does quite a bit every year leading up to fire season, whether that's fire trail maintenance, inspection, enforcement, and even in most extreme cases, we do some forced um, uh, mitigation and abatement of property uh, where we send in a contractor to clean up the most egregious of violations and then lean uh, properties where, uh, where we have a non-responsive or maybe even an irresponsible uh, property owner. Uh, we also prepare our staff. Uh, we prepare our equipment leading into fire season. We upstaff additional resources when needed. So our bulldozer gets staffed for fire season. Uh, that dozer is staffed on a 24-7 basis. Uh, on red flag days, we will upstaff our second bulldozer and operate two dozers. Our hand crew program is a relatively new program to CONFIRE. It's in its third year. Year one and year two were trial years. Year three is being funded by Major X funds. 
um, and that hand crew is available on a seven day a week basis to respond to wildland fires. A great tool in our toolbox uh, where we have a, a group of persons available to do really some of the most backbreaking work that happens on a wildland fire. And then on the flip side, once a fire has been mitigated, that crew is used to get our fire engines and companies back in service faster so that they can handle the, the more routine, the, the medical emergencies and be available in their first two response areas while this hand crew is taking care of some of the mop up and the, the final details of cleaning up after a, a wildland fire. Uh, additionally, um, we have a fledgling helicopter program uh, that we've been uh, in a partnership for a couple of years. So we anticipate getting our helicopter back uh, this week or next from uh, out of maintenance where we have some water dropping capability available right here in the county, immediately available to respond to wildland fires. And then of course we have our partners at CAL FIRE and our partners throughout the county where we work together. Um, within the county, we have a boundary drop scenario where we um, are, we dispatch for Moraga Rinda or our resources flow back and forth between our two communities every day. A uh, very similar agreement with San Ramon Valley Fire. So in the central part of the county, resources are flowing back and forth, uh, kind of a boundaryless uh, line, if you will, closest resource concept where we, we all share. And then uh, we, we also collaborate with County OAS. We work on evacuation planning. We had a major evacuation and um, uh, drill today involving County OAS where we had a mix of personnel in the field and a personnel at the county EOC working on the interagency coordination that happens at, at that level every day in our county to some degree. Uh, but today we drilled on much larger scenarios uh, where we work together with a lot of our partners from throughout the county. Uh, lastly, tools in terms of uh, residents, what residents can do. Of course, um, it, it, it's kind of an old adage, but help us help you. So if you can make improvements to your property, uh, you can improve the, the access to your property. You have well-marked address signs. Uh, you know, we are more likely to end up at your home for a medical emergency than we are for some sort of fire event. But in the event, we need to be able to get fire apparatus, ambulance in and out of your driveway. Uh, if you can improve that defensible space around your home and your property, uh, your property is going to have a fighting chance during a, a significant wildland fire. Uh, the residence guide is available. That's on our website. It's on the Lafayette website. There's a lot of information on residence guide about preparing your family, preparing your property, signing up for the community warning system, um, a lot of tools and methods that we use to notify the public in the event of a major incident. And uh, with that, Council Member, uh, I'm I'm happy to to uh, fill in blanks or answer questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, we'll any questions, please, uh, members of the public are welcome to type them in the chat or in the Q and A bar, and we're going to uh, post them to uh, Chief McAllister afterwards. Um, but uh, I also want to thank you and offer a shout out yesterday for Confire to do a, a focused session on the Firewise program, and uh, that there will be a, a link uh, in our um, lovelafayette.org slash wildfire website uh, as resources so that people can watch the replay of that very helpful session about Firewise. Uh, but now let's turn it to our police chief. Uh, ben Aldrit has been in the police force for 20 years in law enforcement, and he's been our own chief for the last four years, and he's going to give us an update on uh, what's happening here. Good evening, everybody. I will uh, start out with a brief PowerPoint here. All right, I remember this day from September 2019 when we had our fire above Akalani's by the tennis club. Um, this is a day we definitely don't want to repeat in our community. Um, <clears throat> in the last three or four years, we've continued to push forward on having our community better be prepared. Um, if you look at city council goals and this current fiscal year and prior years, emergency preparedness has been at the top of that. Uh, as your police chief, I also serve as your emergency services manager. And coming up next will be our emergency services coordinator who works out of the police department. Uh, John Cornell will be covering some additional topics. Uh, the police department in partnership with the emergency Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission continually review and revise our city's emergency operations plan along with our wildfire uh, plan. Um, 
public safety power shutoffs uh, to date this year. Uh, we've not heard any word of those coming, but we have installed a lot of generator taps at our main intersections. So whether it's uh, a power outage by pg e or other emergencies, we do have the power ability to uh, power our uh, some of our major intersections. Community warning system, we continue to push that. Uh, if you have not signed up for the community warning system, I really encourage you to do that. Um, that is through the Contra Costa County Office of the Sheriff, the, and we'll have some links we'll talk about here towards the end. Um, Alert Wildfire, we'll cover this in a minute, uh, along with Zone Haven and Lafayette's own community and emergency radio station, AM 1670. Uh, in 2019, we put out our first Lumber and a Residence Guide to Wildfire Preparedness and Evacuation. Um, and in 2022, this year, we re did a minor revision on it, put a new cover on it, and mailed that out to every La Mirinda home. Um, and this was in partnership. Uh, thank you to Duncan Siebert and our Emergency Preparedness Commission in making a revision and getting this out. And of course, in the spirit of La Mirinda, we always want to partner with our two other cities and get the word out for all of our community members here. So if you have not did not receive this guide in the mail or maybe you accidentally threw it out or would like another copy it can be downloaded as a pdf from the city's website along with at city offices and at the police department you can come in and pick up a hard copy if you'd like to do so <clears throat> excuse me zone haven has been a partnership with our our fire departments over the last couple of years um, with con fire and margarinda fire um, zone haven if you we talk about our evac evacuation zones, um, we have them throughout La Mirinda. They're designed for us and the police and fire side to be able to better manage uh, evacuations if it becomes necessary. But a lot of people have questions about what zone do they live in and what does that look like? And so if you're interested in that, you can uh, visit www.community.zonehaven.com. Um, but uh, for you all, when we give the notice, um, it'll be coming directly to you through the community warning system. Again, we talked about this. Um, they measure it by households. We have a little over 10,000 households here in Lafayette, and uh, we have over 9,500 signups in Lafayette. So if you have not signed up or signed up your family or, or not sure if you did, uh, please consider going to their website, cwsalerts.com, to register and learn a little bit more about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll talk about uh, notifications from the police department here in a minute and how that ties in with CWS. Um, we do have our AM radio station. Um, if you were to tune into it right now, we basically have a recorded loop of, of really basic information. FCC rules require that we keep something live on the air at all times, uh, but we cannot play music. So if you, if you wish it was music, I'm sorry about that. Um, but we do have a, a community information that we put out there in the course, in a case of an emergency, uh, any alerts that we're sending out either via social media or community warning system, we would also duplicate those on our AM 1670 radio station. Um, and just for information, if you live in Orinda or Moraga, you know, Moraga Orinda Fire District has done a test and this radio station uh, has good coverage in that area also. So if you live in uh, Moraga or Orinda, we will partner with Moraga Orinda Fire Department to share information uh, as it applies to those two communities. Uh, little wildfire cameras, I won't spend too much time. John will talk about this in a little more detail. Um, it's a great program run out of the University of Nevada, Reno in partnership with several other universities, including UC San Diego. Uh, but in 2019, Lafayette Police Department began installing cameras throughout Contra Costa County and Alameda. Uh, they're used for detection, alerting, and monitoring wildfires, and we appreciate the partnership from CONFIRE and other fire departments in supporting our endeavor in this. And we have a lot of cameras, and you are able to go look at them uh, live right now if you choose to, and John will explain that a little bit more coming up next. Uh, Duncan Siebert from La Mirinda CERT is not, uh, he's out of town tonight. I'm going to cover a little bit of sort of the blend of La Mirinda CERT with the Emergency Preparedness Commission. As I mentioned, your Emergency Preparedness Commission is in charge of revising and reviewing our emergency operations plans for the city of Lafayette, along with our wildland fire evacuation plan. These are all the various sections that we continually look at within those plans. Uh, Firewise has already been addressed, but we do have a goal to have 10 communities 
at the end of the year. Um, <clears throat> we have several communities that are in the process or expressing interest. And if you are interested in what you and your neighbors can do, uh, please consider going to Confire's website. They did record the presentation from last night and it was very good <clears throat> information on Firewise and what that looks like and how Confire will help you through that process if you wanna take that on. Um, La Marina CERT, uh, CERT is a community emergency response team. There are CERT teams throughout the United States and our community in the La Marina area, it is La Marina CERT. Um, they have a lot of, uh, these are community members, you all, who say, hey, we wanna have additional trainings during an emergency or disaster. We can help our city, help out our neighbors, uh, evacuations, if it's an earthquake. And so uh, the CERT is made up of, of us, of, of La Marina residents who choose to go through the training. It's a nine week series. It is a commitment one night a week. Um, so they are a great resource for us on the police and fire side assisting us, but also it's a great tool for you as a resident if you have an elevated uh, concern or, or you know the risk in our community and want to really get involved, I would encourage you to consider becoming a member of CERT. They do have a basic class starting September 8th, 2022. And as of today, they still have 15 openings. So their website will be on the next page, but if you just Google La Marinda CERT, uh, they'll have a link there if you're interested in the training. So please consider that if you want to do more in this area. <clears throat> There's a lot of information out there. Uh, you can go to the City of Lafayette's website. Uh, we have uh, a lot of information that I just discussed there. La Marina CERT has a lot of useful information for you and your families, also for other services that do provide to the community, fire extinguishers, water drums, things like that. So please consider that. Um, so one of the questions that comes up uh, quite frequently, um, excuse me, just sexing out here, is how are we going to notify you? And so <clears throat> in the case of an emergency, we basically have three tiers. We have social media, we have Nixle, and then we have the community warning system up here. So if there's a, maybe we have a road closure or an accident that's impacting an area of town, typically we're gonna put that information out on social media, both from the police department side and the city of Lafayette side. Um, if it's gonna be a long-term road closure or something that's being impactful for multiple hours, we will put out a Nixle alert. And if you have not signed up for Nixle, it's N-I-X-L-E. I'd please advise you to take a look at that. And then above Nixle is the community warning system. <clears throat> if we are going to tell you to evacuate, it is going to be the community war via the community warning system. We will reshare that message, of course, on Nixle, on social media, but it will first go out through the community warning system. So that is at the top tier. So we'll only use that for the absolute emergency where we need you to start considering to prepare your family and or to get ready to leave now. Um, so if you have not signed up for a community warning system, that is the push. Uh, ideally, you will sign up and never hear from us for the next decade plus, but uh, there's comfort in knowing that you're signed up and so that if we need to or order that evacuation, you'll be first to know uh, through that system. Uh, lastly, and I, I know there'll be some probably some questions tonight, um, the city of Lafayette, in partnership with Confire, does do a lot of various enforcement regarding trees and vegetation. Um, the city of Lafayette does have a code enforcement unit um, that uh, falls underneath the police department. And specific to our code enforcement, uh, if you have a complaint about a certain parcel or property that you feel like may be in violation of a, an existing ordinance, uh, you can uh, submit a request to our code enforcement unit either via the city's website or via the city's app. It's called My Lafayette. You can download that. And uh, not only can you report things to code enforcement, you report things to public works and other, other resources within the city. So please consider downloading My Lafayette app. Uh, but we will come out and address tall grass, weeds, overgrown vegetation. If there are dead trees that are still standing but need to be taken down because they're a fire hazard, we will get involved there. We've, uh, we will get involved if we have hoarders that are creating a fire hazard on their property. And again, there are several things that we do partner with Confire, um, going back and forth with their code enforcement unit. Sometimes it'll be a topic that they take on. Um, but uh, if you have any doubt, 
feel free to hit up our city of Lafayette code enforcement. If it's something they need to refer to Confire, they can do that. But you can also go to Confire's website, report some via code enforcement. So probably not the cleanest answer, but it is a partnership between us and the fire department. And when in doubt, hit one of us up. And if, if we're not the right answer, we'll, we'll guide you to the right answer on that. And that is all. Turn back to you, Councilmember Kwok. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Aldrich. I think we're going to go next to uh, our emergency preparedness coordinator, John Cornell, who has uh, been with the force for eight years. And I also want to say and give a shout out that he's a proud graduate of Akalani's High School and our middle schools. And you've done your whole, you've been like a, the longest serving uh, person with a lot of background here. You know, every nook and cranny of the city, right, John? All that's right. That's right. Turning it over to you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen with a PowerPoint here. All right. So I'm going to talk just briefly about a, uh, a lot of the resources that we have here in the city, um, and then also how citizens can um, help us uh, by kind of staying in the know of what's going on around them. So Alert California, uh, otherwise known as Alert Wildfire, is a program like the chief mentioned uh, that was started uh, out of the University of Nevada, Reno. It primarily focused on uh, the Tahoe region when it was first started and quickly expanded now to a multi-statewide program uh, that aims to install cameras on hilltops and locations that have a wide view area um, that can then be used to not only uh, find wildfires, but also monitor them as um, they are fought. Uh, so that's something that the city started back in 2019. We partnered with Alert Wildfire, and uh, now we have over 50 cameras in the county, um, and a lot of them are used almost every day. Um, this is uh, just one of many pictures from these cameras uh, that obviously this fire was getting uh, very close to the tower. This was up uh, down in Orange County. Again, just another reality of, you know, this is uh, how the fires are being fought and how using technology to monitor their progress can help the firefighters on the ground and help citizens better understand where the fire is, how big it, you know, how big it's growing um, and what they can do, uh, you know, whether it's to self-evacuate, to shelter in place, whatever it might be. Uh, this is just one of the, what camera looks like, uh, really straightforward, really simple. The nice thing about these cameras, one of the things that really drew us to them um, was the ease of installation, the ease of maintenance. It's nothing fancy. Um, there's no proprietary hardware. It's all commercial grade equipment uh, that is easy to fix uh, if it goes down and easy to install, which is huge. Uh, this camera overlooks the Oakland Hills. So this is at the top of one of our antenna towers uh, in the Oakland Hills. You can see the Arinda Country Club and Highway 24 in the background there. So why alert wildfire? Uh, this is kind of the, the real quick um, rundown on, you know, here's what the cameras are for. Um, reduce the response time to wildfires and brush fires, um, quite simply put, uh, figuring out, okay, who needs to go? And that's what the fire department and the police department look at. When there is a fire that happens, we pull up the cameras and we can determine, is this something that we need to send a full response to, or can one or two officers handle it? The ability to scale resources up or down, again, this is uh, on the, the fire side primarily, but we do look at this in the police department um, of how big is this? Do we need to start air resources? Do we need to ask for mutual aid? And that's a huge uh, ability for us to be able to go and see that before the first officer even gets on scene. Um, following the fire behavior, like that first picture that we saw, just looking right at the fire, it could be right there on top of that hilltop and really seeing what it's doing. Uh, provide the critical information. Um, this is something where overnight when you might not have those air resources watching that uh, that fire, you can still have a, a view of it and be able to determine, is it growing? Is it staying the same? Uh, which direction is it moving? And then after the containment, uh, you know, when the fire has been put out, monitoring that area, making sure there's no more flare ups. Uh, and that's, again, uh, back in 2019, when we had the fire above the high school, uh, we had somebody staffed there for another 24 hours, just making sure nothing sparked again. City of Lafayette uh, did invest in a mobile um, camera. And so what this is, it's a solar powered trailer 
with two big batteries on it. And this trailer can be pulled around uh, all over the city and the county. Um, one, to be placed in front of a fire if we had one, and that can help our fire department when there might not be a direct line of sight onto the fire. But then we can also use it for other uh, critical incidents, emergencies, natural disasters, um, to, to get a closer eye of something where you might not want to have um, a person stationed there. This is a perfect example of the, the fires, uh, the fire cameras being used on a fire. Um, this was back in 2019, but this was a pretty large uh, residential fire. And you can see how close it was to those fuel tanks down there in that bottom uh, image. And these are two of the cameras that uh, the city of Lafayette um, worked to install. And uh, again, you can just see the clarity. Um, and as a citizen, being able to go and watch these cameras, which you are able to do is huge. Um, to determine if the fire is close to your house, far away, where the smoke is coming from to kind of put you at ease. Uh, these are just a, a couple of quick examples. I'll go back to this one. No, no, here we go. So this is a uh, the Bonnie Dune camera in Santa Cruz. This was back in 2020, and you can see the fire coming right up to the tower there. And uh, that last image is actually the final image from the camera as the uh, the infrastructure at the base of that tower was burned. But you can see how those cameras are really used to, to watch that fire and figure out how fast it's spreading and what the behavior is. One other resource for the public that uh, can really be helpful, not only for the public to see what's going on, but that we use uh, in the police department and fire department is the PG&E weather safety um, app. And this is a web-based program that links uh, all of their weather stations together. Uh, so these are all the PG&E weather stations that PG&E has been installing over the uh, last couple of years. And this is live data. So uh, this is from a weather station that could be positioned on a telephone pole, on a rooftop of a building, or even up on Mount Diablo. And it shows you the real uh, real-time uh, data that can be used to figure out which direction the wind might be pushing the fire. A um, couple of resources, well, not a couple, but all of our other resources that the city of Lafayette here has invested in. Um, and these are to help our citizens. So, you know, when, when we need to do an evacuation or we need to set up a shelter, um, we might have a power outage, whatever it might be. We've uh, developed a, a wide range of resources to be able to manage those, um, those incidents. Um, multiple community shelter locations. So we have contracts in place with different buildings and different um, companies around here to help us with those shelters so that we can set them up quickly. The chief mentioned the AM radio station, so I won't go over that. We do have direct communications to our schools now. So the police department can communicate directly with uh, the school staff. So if uh, for whatever reason, we might not be able to send a officer to that school immediately, we can still have direct communications over our radio system so that we're not relying on cell phones. Portable AC and heating system, again, part of that shelter setup process. Um, we can take something like a gymnasium at Stanley Middle School, and even if it's 110 degrees out with no power in the neighborhood, we can bring in our portable air conditioner unit and cool that facility down and bring people in um, if they're evacuated. Satellite internet, that's uh, here at, at all of our sites. Um, so multiple sites around the city we have uh, set up with satellite internet. And if we were to have a, a major disaster where normal infrastructure, cell phone and Comcast and AT&T were down, uh, we could bring citizens in and let them communicate on their cell phones like they normally would using that, uh, that internet connection. Um, trailer generators, just another one of our assets that we have to be able to help us set up uh, shelters. Um, radios for volunteers. So like the chief mentioned with CERT, uh, if we have to call in our volunteers to help us uh, with evacuations, traffic control, or just help us at the shelters. We have radios so that we can communicate with them. We do have a portable cell phone tower. And again, that's one of those things that we invested in um, more for when we do have to have citizens uh, exit their home and go to a central location. They can use their phone to call loved ones, let people know that they're okay using their normal means of communication because that's what people are used to and that's what will put them at ease. Um, portable Wi-Fi and charging stations, again, another asset that uh, when you come to a shelter, when you're evacuated and you don't have any of your cell phone chargers because you left them at home, we've invested in all of that to make sure that, you know, we can help you uh, get back online and let people know that, hey, I'm okay. This is where I am. This is what I need. Um, one thing that we've been working on for the last couple of years with PSPS primarily um, happening is generator backups. And this is something that uh, no other city has in the county. 
Uh, so we've actually equipped all of our traffic signals uh, along Mount Diablo, Moraga Road, and Pleasant Hill with generator backup. Um, if you go to other cities, you'll uh, see that the lights flash red when the power goes out, and that's running on a battery that usually lasts around 8 to 12 hours. Here in Lafayette, we would bring out a generator, and the lights would actually function properly, um, allowing for normal traffic flow, allowing for an evacuation to occur faster and allowing our uh, officers to be used in other locations instead of doing traffic control at those intersections. And uh, this year we added a mobile communications trailer uh, and that's something that we could bring out to an incident command post um, like a Stanley Middle School or the community center. And that allows all of our agencies when we're in unified command with the fire department or pg &E or the Red Cross to have a central location for everybody to gather around and have those communication capabilities that we're used to in normal day-to-day um, -day operation. Uh, this is the radio station, so I won't talk on that because the chief mentioned it, um, but that is the link there, and we're going to put the, I believe we already put the link in the chat, and then these are the two other links that I mentioned, so Alert California or Alert Wildfire, that's the link right there that the public can go to. You can cruise around it yourself. You can see the cameras, pull them up, um, and when there is a fire in the county, you can almost be sure that when you go to that link, you will see where that fire is after the camera has been moved to watch it by uh, pg e Cal Fire, or Contra Costa Fire. Um, all of them have access to go in and position those cameras. And then the pg e Weather Analytics page. And with that, Councilmember Kwok, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, John. And I'm, I'm happy to see Kathy dropping some of those links into the chat for people who are interested in clicking. I do want to comment on, you know, that, John, you went over that very quickly, but uh, in the last three years, our police department and you in particular have uh, put uh, a lot of investment into our hardware, software, and technology resources to use cameras and uh, sensors to get us ready and uh, backup generators. And so there's been, a, a, with the heightened risk we've seen in the last few years, I'm really pleased to see our, our police and fire services uh, really stepping up and organizing and collaborating. We saw the logos of PG&E on there. We saw the logos of CONFIRE, CAL FIRE. Uh, and I know that John has gone and helped other agencies to deploy cameras for our mutual benefit, right? So that we can all be sharing. Uh, and that's, it's just been great to see the communities in different cities and counties pull together uh, to share resources. So uh, I think that really brings us to like, yes, we've done a good job as uh, stepping up our game. We really need the public's help now to also get involved in this. And so I wanna turn it over to the American Red Cross, uh, Brianna Taylor, who's been a volunteer for how many years? There's 17 years as a volunteer and currently serving as um, the resident, the uh, regional uh, disaster chair. But how, Brianna, tell us how, how can the public be getting ready and uh, do our part? What can we all do to, to be ready for wildfire? Well, thanks, Council Member. I'm going to put my preparedness hat on today. Um, and I'm going to share, um, share a few. a few slides so that we can talk about what the public can do, what you can do to make yourself and your family safe. You know, in a disaster, we always think that somebody's going to come and take care of us. Um, we, we assume that somebody will be there and we won't have to do anything. But however, resources just aren't there to support everyone immediately. First responders, disaster organizations, government agencies, and hospital emergency rooms, we all do our best. But on average, these groups are staffed and prepared for a normal day. Um, and resources may be limited during a disaster when it first happens. And the truth is that we will have to depend on ourselves because roads may be impassable, utilities may be unavailable, hospitals, and first responders may be overloaded, and banks, grocery stores, gas stations, pharmacies, schools, workplaces may be closed for days. So we may also need to help others um, as members of our community, members of our households, uh, neighbors who have functional and access needs. So don't count on help being there right away. All of us can and should be prepared to help ourselves and our households. Will preparedness be perfect for us? No. Will preparedness make things quick 
easy and painless during a disaster? Not always, but planning and preparing will help us be safe and recover more quickly. So at Red Cross, we have three simple steps. Get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. We're gonna go over those in a little bit more detail. Get a kit. So what we wanna see everyone do is build a kit that you'll have at home, but also create a go bag that you can put in your car or you can take to work because we know that we don't sit at home 24 hours a day, that we're in different places. When my daughters started driving, what they got for their 16th birthday wasn't a car. It was a go bag that went into the family car so that when they drove, they knew that if something happened, they would be okay. We also wanna make sure that we have things in that kit for all members of our households. That includes children, that includes older adults, that includes people with access and functional needs. So we need to make sure that our kit addresses the needs of everyone. So let's take a look at what are the important things to have in a kit? And all this information is also on the Love Lafayette web slash wildfires website. So you don't have to write notes on all of this, but I just want to go over it and bring up a few things that you might not be thinking of. So starting with the basics, food, water, and any life-saving items that members of your household may need in order to stay healthy, safe, and independent. And some of these include, you know, non-perishable items, easy to prepare food items. Don't forget a manual can opener. It's great to have those items, but if you can't open them, what good are they? And many of them these days have the pop top, which is what you wanna look for also. Think about drinking water. You should have at least one gallon of water per person per day. Half of that water is for drinking and the other half is for sanitation. You also need things like a flashlight and a battery powered or hand cranked radio. And if possible, to get something with a NOAA weather radio channel on it, um, NOAA weather radio. And that, can, that way you can receive important information about um, emergencies, what's going on with the weather. Also sign up in advance for the community warning system to receive those notifications so that you'll have all the information that you need. Don't forget extra batteries. Um, just because there's batteries in your flashlight doesn't mean that those batteries won't wear out or how long have they been there. You want to have a first aid kit, a seven-day supply of medications, and keep a copy of the prescriptions and medications and the dosage, and the treatment information that's relevant to everybody in the family. There's nothing more devastating than somebody showing up at one of our shelters in need of medication but they don't know what they take. Um, it takes us a while to find that out in order to help them. So make it easy on yourself. Make sure you have a copy of all that information. And make sure if you have, um, if you are dependent on a mobility device or oxygen um, or other assistive technology, that you have backup batteries for that. A multi-purpose tool is always nice to have. Um, sanitation and personal hygiene items, copies of important documents, pictures of family members. There's nothing more heartbreaking than looking for a missing person and not having a picture of what they looked like for the officials to look. Extra cash, small bills. You don't wanna have to go into um, a grocery store where the power may be out and give them a $50 bill for uh, a gallon of water. So make sure you have those small bills. At least one emergency blanket and maps of the area. Um, you know, we used to use maps, but we don't use them anymore because we depend on our cell phones. But if we don't have cell phone coverage or something has happened to our phones, a map is a nice thing to have. 
So now don't feel overwhelmed by all these things that I'm saying, because preparedness is a process and it takes a little while, but just start building your kit um, one step at a time, focus on maybe one item a week. And before you know it, you'll have your kit. Now, don't forget pets when you think about a preparedness kit or service animals and make sure that you have food, water, identification tags, and any other necessary supplies that um, your pets may need. And you need to customize that kit. Customize that kit to what's going on in your family. Um, things like baby formula um, or extra set of car um, vehicle keys or house keys in there. And Add other things like rain gear or towels or work gloves. I mean, just think of the things that you might need. Extra clothing, a hat, sturdy shoes, plastic sheeting to keep things dry. I never go anywhere without duct tape. Um, it's a great resource to use. Uh, it, it, it will help you with many different things. Okay, so let's move on to step two, make a plan. Talk with everyone in your household about how to prepare and how to respond to the hazards that are most likely to happen in your area. Know the plans of where your children go to school. What is the plan there? Identify responsible family members and give them a, a, a task or a job to do as something if they need, if you need to evacuate. And think about those individuals with access and functional needs. They need to prepare differently. That may be somebody in your immediate family. It may be a grandparent. Um, but you need to create a personal support network for people with access and functional needs. And we're looking at a minimum of maybe three people who can help those um, during a disaster. Again, a network for them. And practice your plans with your family. Um, the kids love to do it. Everybody feels more confident and in control when something happens, if they know what to do. And don't forget about what you'll do with your pets. I can't stress that enough. And in your plan, you want to cover how to evacuate, where to meet your family members if you become separated or you aren't together when something happens. Choose two places to meet, one right outside of your house and one outside of the area. Know how to communicate the information. Um, it's really important when you make a disaster plan that everybody knows what that plan is. Um, it's not a plan where you sit down and create it and it's done. It's a plan that the whole family works and creates and then the family practices. Uh, an important part of the disaster plan is to let other people who are involved know what the plan is, an out of the area contact person if you can't reach one another. And again, I can't stress enough, once you have your plan, practice, practice, and practice it. So now you've completed two steps, and now we're on to step three. But you are taking care of step three by being on this call. Um, Step three is to become informed. Know your community. Uh, understand what may happen in the area, what the resources are in the area. Um, so subscribe to the community warning system. Download other emergency apps that will help you, first aid apps that may help you. Use the NOAA radio, uh, weather radio to listen to local stations to find out what is going on. Know your neighbors, help your neighbors. Um, and don't think that, tra that disasters just happen where you live. Disasters happen everywhere. And so when you're traveling, you also need to think about what you would do if a disaster happened. Um, not to deviate, but we happened to be in Thailand when the Indian Ocean tsunami hit. You can't get a bigger disaster than that. So seriously, when you are traveling, think about what you may need to do when you're gone if something happens. Listen for updates. 
listen to special instructions and follow them. So now you've completed step one, step two, and step three. There are tools you can use. Red Cross has an emergency contact card that you can put in your wallet, you can put in your kid's backpack, which has all the information that we've been talking about. And there are apps that you can use. Now, I just wanna finish up by talking a moment about when a wildfire is near, what do you do right before a wildfire? It depends on how much time you have to evacuate. If a wildfire is in the area, you need to be ready to leave immediately because we know how quickly conditions can change. When it's a red flag warning, you need to be thinking about, is your disaster kit updated? Are you ready to go if you need to go? You don't need, it's, not, it's, it's important to pay attention to those warnings. Back your vehicles into your driveway, um, get them out of your garage to make it easier in, in case you need to leave quickly. And when it's a red flag warning day, stay informed by listening to local radio, TV stations, um, for updated emergency information, knowing what's happening. Information is power. And you will then be, you will then be notified of evacuation information and routes that you need to take. Um, you'll be you'll be told where evacuation sites are that you may go to to stay safe. And make sure you follow all those instructions issued by the local authorities. During a major wildfire, you know, news crews always say the same thing. The people are surprised at how fast a fire moves or that they only have five or 10 minutes to evacuate. So don't wait. Follow orders. If you see something, call 911. If you see a fire approaching, um, get everybody out. When authorities issue a warning, you need to act. Make sure your car is ready to go during those days with all the things that you have ready, whether you go to a shelter or you go to a friend's. It makes all the difference when you have some personal things with you. So I just wanted to share those tips today. Um, go on to Love Lafayette, um, go to Red Cross. There's a lot, there are many, many more tips. And what you do now will determine how safe you and your family will be when something happens. Thank you Thanks so you much. Okay. Thanks for all the great tips, Brianna. You're welcome. Um, all right, good. Well, we're ready to go into the last part of our session, which is a question and answers with uh, each of you members of the public. We actually have 26 people who are joining us tonight, so don't be shy to ask a question. Either raise your hand um, and we'll call on you, or you could type a question in the chat if you'd like. There have been a couple questions in the chat so far, so we could start with that while we wait for anybody who would like to raise their hand. But uh, there's a question from Brad that asks that, Cal Fire reports that acres burned year to date is only about 15% of last year's 2021 as of this date. So who should we be thanking for uh, for that, uh, the fact that we're at 15% of fire so far? Maybe that's for, for Deputy Chief McAllister. Well, I'll, I'll start with uh, Mother Nature. First of all, we've had uh, very few red flag days this season so far. Um, I mentioned earlier that our peak uh, time is coming. It is uh, September and October where we see the most devastating fires, um, but it has been pretty mild, maybe moderate, but so far we have not seen an extreme year. So Mother Nature, uh, the community, I think has a heightened sense of awareness based on what you mentioned earlier, council member, the last five years, we have seen utter devastation. So um, the landscape has changed. Things are different. This wildland fire environment that we live in um, has seen some extremes that I have not seen in my career uh, over the last five years. So, um, so far, so good this year, uh, but don't let your guard down. Yeah, speaking of which, I remember I met you right before the 4th of July weekend, and you were very, very concerned about uh, fireworks uh, that weekend. And fortunately, Mother Nature had a very cool weekend that weekend, and right, so we did luck out. Uh, that those coincided, but otherwise the risks of those things are, are certainly there, as I recall you telling me. 
Uh, thank you for that. Uh, there was another question also from uh, Brad asking whether uh, if you report a negligent homeowner regarding uh, vegetation management or a dead tree or something, and you called either code enforcement in Lafayette or con fire, uh, will that neighbor know who, uh, to who, who reported them? Yeah, con fire will accept an anonymous complaint. If somebody's in violation of a statute or a code, they're in violation. So it uh, really doesn't matter uh, where that originated. We will accept an anonymous complaint. Okay, terrific. That is the same with the city of Lafayette. Um, but I think uh, Deputy or Assistant Fire Chief last night, Chris Bachman, mentioned, you know, do talk to your neighbors. You know, we, we encourage you to, to try to resolve things with your neighbors, educate each other. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that or you've already tried that avenue, uh, for sure you can report that anonymously to us or con fire as it's appropriate. Great. Thank you for clarifying that, Chief Aldred. Okay. Uh, I got another um question via text just now. And that question relates to wildland urban interface areas. And the question is, does CONFIRE have any plan to designate part of its service district as a wildland urban interface fire area? Well, um, I would describe very much of the Lafayette community, if not the entire community, to be in a wildland urban interface area, uh, much of the county. And really a simple definition is that's where development meets the wildland. So if it's there's a hill, a mountain, um, and we have that that uh, grassy, brushy trees area, that, that is a wildland urban interface. That's where they interface, that's where they mix. Um, perhaps the question is getting at some of the wildland fire hazard severity zones. And we are expecting those zones to be updated by the state of California, by Cal Fire, who has the responsibility for that. We are expecting new fire hazard severity zones to come out later this year. And uh, we are anticipating those zones to be significantly expanded. So uh, currently those zones are in uh, very high, high, and then uh, uh, I think uh, the basic fire hazard severity zone. Uh, so we expect those zones to be expanded and much more communities to be included in the very high zones. That's not good news, I'm sure, especially for our insurance, our homeowners insurance. But uh, I, I did learn in yesterday's FireWise talk that uh, several insurance companies, uh, USAA, State Farm and Mercury, are offering discounts for uh, homeowners insurance if you're in a FireWise neighborhood and, and are doing things to mitigate your fire, fire risk. Is that is that correct? That is correct. Now, the insurance landscape throughout the state, based on the last five years, is very challenging and very difficult. It is a statewide issue. And we receive routine calls almost every day from people that are having challenges. Uh, but I would encourage property owners and the insurance companies to, to really ground truth, right? So document what you've done on your property. You've made improvements. You made things safer. You can make that case to your insurance company that you have taken certain actions to make your property safer. There's ways to harden your home and there's information about that on our website to make your property safer. Right, I even got a visit from one of your fire inspectors who spent 30 minutes walking around my house to give such specific suggestions on what we can do. So I, I thank you and uh, I know that that, that type of um, help that the fire department is providing us can help us harden our homes and prepare our properties better. Uh, and again, that's part of what you're offering is in the FireWise program and a, a good reason to join. Yes. All right. Uh, I don't see any hands out there. I, let's see if there are any other questions here. Uh, Council Member Dawson uh, has a, a comment, so I'll read that for her. Uh, she says, thank you, Chief McAllister, Ben, Brianna, and John for the excellent presentations. And um, I would say a commendation, not a question there. We're fortunate for your care and professionalism. Well, thank you, Council Member Dawson, for, for uh, that comment. Um, so uh, give while uh, one last chance for questions, otherwise I'm going to put a plug in for what the chief said about our our updated wildfire preparedness and evacuation brochure. Uh, Brianna just was going through a whole list of things. You, you're right. You sort of overwhelmed us with the number of things there. But the good news is uh, I can turn to page uh, eight here and see what recommendations there are for a go bag, what documents I should be scanning, what preparedness action I should be taking 
What about disabled and functional needs individuals and so forth? So this is this is a gold mine to get started on, uh, at least a very simple and I, I would say uh, uh, what I would say a go to document that everybody in Lafayette should have received a couple months ago. And if you don't have one yet, you can download it from lovelafayette.org slash wildfire for a PDF copy. Uh, you can stop by the, um, the police station and in the lobby there, there's a whole stack of these. And so uh, I think this is a great uh, uh, go-to resource for um, our first step. So with that, let's see, um, don't see any other questions or hands. So we'll, uh, we'll thank our panelists for joining us tonight. We thank members of the public for being here and members of the media who I've seen in the audience. Thank you for your interest. And uh, we'll sign off and wish everybody a good evening and, and a safe uh, rest of the month. Thank you. Good night, everybody.